the morning. I know that because she's Central Time in Minnesota and Dr. Sakers in North Carolina, it looks like, from her wonderful background. And we're super excited to have you with us this uh, morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. It's Wednesday, February 9th, at least for me. And I don't know where you are around the world, which is why I say that, because as you know, whenever we do our YouTube live events, we love when you type in where you're logging on from, from around the country and around the world. We always love to see our friends in uh, Portugal and Romania and then all across the United States. So uh, as we banter back and forth a little bit, allowing everyone to log on, please go ahead and type in that comment section on our YouTube page where we're broadcasting live right now, where you are logging in from around the world. There are those numbers go as people are uh, maybe getting their lunch breaks. Here we have Iowa. Um, like I said before, I'm on the East Coast. My name is Garrett Pactinger. I'm the co-founder of Vecro along with Justine, and I'm just outside of the Philadelphia area. Justine, what about you? I am based out of Minnesota, and uh, we are. We had a heat wave yesterday. We were 40 degrees, so we were walking <laughs> around in shorts. So it was very exciting. <laughs> and I'm looking across here at New Mexico, Puerto Rico, the UK, New Hampshire, West Virginia, Michigan, Indiana. Dr. Saker, what about you? Well, <laughs> this is amazing. I'm from North Carolina, and um, and it's not really winter here right now, but um, but we're enjoying it. We have a couple more. I see we have our Portugal, Wisconsin, Georgia, Canada, Mexico, New England, Washington, Los Angeles, North Carolina. So look, as I, as I promised Dr. Saker, this truly would be a, a an international worldwide event. So really excited to have you all with us. Thanks for taking the opportunity, whether you have the pleasure of a day off or you're just managing to um, wolf down, as we say, a granola bar in between all of your cases, because that's your fancy meal these days. You have a 40 patients on the docket. We appreciate your time. We appreciate you spending about 30 minutes with us and learning about feeding the sick kidney. With that said, I want to be respectful of all your time. And so we're just going to go over a couple of housekeeping items as we move forward, and then we'll get to Dr. Saker. So we're here today talking about feeding the sick kidney. And the first thing I did want to say is I definitely want to give a big shout out to Blue Buffalo, Blue Natural Veterinary Diets. As many of you know, when we have the pleasure of an amazing educational partner like Blue, we're able to provide our race-approved continuing education completely free and complimentary, not only in the United States domestically, but to the world as we see it. So sincerely, thank you to Blue for being here with us today and supporting our education and this awesome event. If this is your first Vecral webinar, what you're going to quickly learn is that we are the tech savvy way to get your online education. We provide this year over 200 hours of live interactive race approved CE during the year. It's awesome. And we do it in a multimedia approach, whether it's a webinar, a round, this is a YouTube live, which is kind of like a mini webinar, our blogs, our podcasts. We love doing all different styles of clinically relevant, practical, cutting edge and unbiased education at really a cost effective price. As an individual veterinarian, you can sign up for $269 for a full year. Interns, residents, new graduates and nurses get a 30% discount. And then as you see on this slide, we have our team plan. So we make it really cost effective if you want multiple members of your hospital to join and sign up at the same time. We also hope you're listening to our Apple podcast, whether I should say podcast, whether on Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, radio.com. It's a great way to get some clinical information that's cutting edge, journal reviews that are just really practical, whether you're walking the dog, on the treadmill, uh, commuting to work. It's a great way to listen and learn. And many of you also know that we have now six different certificate programs. These are carefully curated pieces of content that we put together to help you become more proficient in this specific area. I know, I think it's uh, about 10 days from now, we have our next webinar on our ophthalmology certificate program. So it's a great way really to focus down, get some fine tuned information about topics. We have basic and advanced emergency medicine, nutrition, practice management, ophthalmology and anesthesia analgesia. And we put out at least one to two new certificate programs each and every year. Obviously, we know you love seeing us on social as this is our YouTube live event, but whether you like us on Facebook, tweet with us on Twitter, 
dance with us on TikTok or hang out with us on YouTube. We just love that interaction. All right, this is super important. I'm gonna stop here, focus, because this is how, as I said, our content is race approved. This is live and interactive. For our YouTube live events, this is how you have to get your CE certificate. I know Justine already posted the link in that chat bar. Either you can use your fancy phone and, to, and look with your camera at this QR code. So if I take my phone and I use it, okay, I'm gonna go right up to that QR code and I get a little tiny URL. I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna open up directly to, boom, that form that you need to fill out to get your CE certificate. I know it's gonna pop up right there. There's that form, okay? So whether you use your fancy smartphone and use that QR code or that URL, tinyurl.com slash vetgirl2922, which is today's date, February 9th, 22, to try to make it easy. That's how you fill out the form. We're gonna leave this form open throughout the entire presentation and for 30 minutes after the event, so you don't have to worry about missing the content, but please make sure that's the only way to get your CE certificate, QR code, or that URL. Finally, on YouTube, make sure you make this full screen. We don't want it to be a little pocket for you. You wanna see those slides nice and big. My arrow is showing that little box right there. Make sure you make your window a full screen. All right, with that said, I know you're not here to listen to myself or Justine today. We're here to listen to Dr. Saker. So Dr. Saker, if you can give us a little background, we know you're in North Carolina, but what do you do there? What are your passions? And then please take it away. The floor will be yours. Oh, I'd love to. And I just have to say, I'm just blown away with all these, um, these people from all these different places listening in. This is so exciting. Um, yes, I am from North Carolina. I'm here at the vet school in Raleigh. I am a board certified um, veterinary nutritionist. And uh, I my role here is to basically feed all of the sick animals in the hospital, both the large animals and the small animals. We do the majority of our feeding um, plans for animals in the ICU and intermediate care. We do a lot of uh, chronic disease feeding, but we also do a lot of assisted feeding placing feeding tubes and intravenous feeding. Um, and that is my passion. Uh, clinical nutrition for veterinary patients is my passion. And I'm so excited to be able to share some of that, some of my inf information with all of you today. So I'd like, to, um, I'd like to get started. I'd like to walk through this topic with you. And I'd like to start by um, by talking about when, when, um, when should you start targeted feeding for renal patients? And then I wanna move on to what kind of diet picture in terms of nutrients, uh, it, does the compromised kidney say, can they safely handle the compromised kidney? And finally, we'll talk about diets, what's available. So um, from there, I'd uh, like to do a quick review on determining how sick the kidneys really are. And we know, um, we've all learned that the common indicators for evaluating kidney function are BUN and creatinine. And then um, along with that, we use, um, if you could click on to the next, uh, the next, if you could click on for me, Garrett. No. Nope. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay. So I'm sorry. There, there we go. There we go. So, so we use B, we know to use BO and creatinine and along with serum phosphorus in the presence or absence of hypertension, um, we roll over to looking at determining what stage of renal disease we have using the iris guidelines. Um, also go ahead and click again. There's a couple other things we are aware of in these patients. Um, polyuria, polydipsia, kind of take a look at where the serum potassium is falling, as well as um, evaluating the animal's body condition or fat cover, as well as their muscling. Uh, are they losing muscle mass during the course of the disease? Okay. So um, we all know, especially if we've been in practice, even just a short period of time, that there are some limitations associated with our traditional kidney diagnostics. Uh, everything from... Uh, from muscling of the animal that can impact the creatinine level. Uh, there may be other organ dysfunctions going on that can impact the BUN. And go ahead and, and click again. There's, go ahead and, and click through this slide. There we go. And you can see that sometimes the, 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 value, the indicators for kidney disease um, are too expensive or not practical to use in, in our general practice setting. And sometimes we get false positives. And so, 
um, to try and overcome that or to try and work with these limitations, we now have another uh, tool in our pocket. We could click on to the next slide, please. And that's called SDMA. And it's been around for just a little while. We know that IDEX has uh, developed this, uh, this early indicator of progressive decline in renal function. And so a couple more clicks, Garrett. And, um, and it's interesting because this is allowing us to detect the changes in renal function, specifically glomerular filtration rate, a lot earlier than we can by just using looking at creatinine alone. And SDMA is really nice too because it isn't affected by a lot of the um, factors that impact um, creatinine and BUN and things like that. So that said, um, we'll roll into um, what, what are the recommendations? When should you start uh, targeted nutrition support for the renal patient? Well, if you base your, your assessment on iris staging, uh, you're going to be looking at starting drugs and fluids as needed, of course. But then the generalized nutrition intervention based on iris staging really suggests you start at stage two if the serum creatinine is, is in excess of the reference interval. But um, go ahead and click again for me. But if you're using SDMA along with those traditional markers, then we can detect it earlier. Uh, we can detect it basically in stage one. There may not be any azotemia, but if our SDMA values are over our reference range, then we know that there is um, renal compromise occurring. And so I, I would suggest that starting uh, in stage one based on SDMA is really the way to go. So now that we have an idea of when to start, uh, we might want to, you might ask, you might ask the question, well, why? Why should we start that early? You know, they're not showing, they're not azotemic, they're not really showing, you know, terrible signs of renal disease. Well, starting that early in early stage, it's a lot easier to get them to transition to these targeted nutrient diets. Um, and there's because they're still eating, they're usually um, active and trying to get a diet transition in an animal that's still eating inactive is way easier than when they're nauseous, not feeling well, et cetera. Um, we know that, that addressing renal disease earlier is going to slow the progression of renal changes. We can't reverse them, but we can certainly slow it down. This will help increase their lifespan uh, as well as improve their quality of life, both for the pet as well as for the pet caregiver. All right. If, we're, if we know that we want to start early, then we want to have some goals, okay? Whether you're doing medical treatment, surgical intervention, or nutritional intervention, hopefully you always have a goal in mind or goals in mind that you want to reach by, by doing this intervention. So our nutritional goals for the renal patient include, uh, above all, trying to meet their nutrient and energy requirements. Uh, we have to understand that when they're not eating, they start breaking down their body stores of fat, meaning their adipose, as well as their lean muscle mass to obtain both fat for energy and protein to help the daily protein turnover needs of the patient. And so we want to get their um, nutrient energy requirements met. At the same time, we want to make sure that these key nutrients that are um, that can influence renal function are at the right level so that they're better tolerated by the animal with kidney renal compromise. Of course, alleviate signs of uremia and minimize disturbances in other fluids, electrolytes, obviously vitamins and minerals, acid base, and overall, this whole thing, our goal is to slow the progression of the disease. Okay, so we know we're gonna start early. And we have some goals that we're gonna try and hit. So now I need to just think about the nutrients. What are the nutrients that uh, the, the compromised kidney really needs in terms of levels and, and sources? And so above all, no matter what stage of renal disease your patient has, phosphorus is the number one nutrient that you wanna focus on. And there've been lots of studies that show that if we reduce the phosphorus levels in the diet, we can slow the progression of renal disease, okay? 
along with phosphorus, there are other nutrients that are important as well. Certainly protein, a lot of us get hung up on, should we reduce the protein level in the diet or should we not? And I think, well, I'll talk about that in just a little while, but phosphorus is number one. Then protein, obviously water is very important um, to keep these animals well hydrated, particularly if they have PUPD. And then um, sodium, if they have, if they're hypertensive, we certainly wanna manage the sodium level. Potassium, sometimes they're hyper, sometimes they're hypokalemic. So we wanna look at that in the diet as well. Um, there's usually inflammation associated with renal changes, so omega-3 fatty acids. And then we know that renal disease, as well as some other diseases, are, um, are, are diseases of high oxidative stress. So getting some antioxidants in there can be really, really helpful in preserving tissue. So um, how exactly do these nutrients really help? And so um, they can actually slow progression and impact survivability by altering certain um, pathophysiologic mechanisms. As you can see, just for instance, we can help prevent the onset of uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism uh, by, by managing the phosphorus level. We can um, decrease tubular deterioration or slow it down by addressing um, the protein level in the diet as well as the make sure um, the buffering, make sure the diet has the right pH. So um, we can also impact glomerular hyper, hyperfiltration in terms of decreasing that by um, adjusting our protein level, of course, adjusting the sodium level in the diet, and also by adjusting or enhancing the omega-3 fatty acid content in the diet. So um, if we stick on that, on that note of, of decreasing um, glomerular hyperfiltration, and we focus on omega-3 fatty acids, um, what is the connection there? Well, obviously the connection is inflammation. You know, with a glomerular nephritis, there's quite a bit of inflammation. And so we also know that omega-3 fatty acids have the, have the ability to decrease the inflammatory state in the body. As you can see here in this little, um, this little table, or this little chart rather, that omega-3s are, um, are metabolized through uh, desaturation and elongation down to um, EPA or eicosapentaenoic acid and uh, DHA or docosahexaenoic acid. I'm sure you, if you don't know those acids, long names, you certainly have, are familiar with EPA and DHA terminology. And they are the components that are actually the biologically active anti-inflammatory aspects of omega-3 fatty acids. So really the best way to enhance the level of EPA and DHA and decrease or mitigate the inflammation in the glomerular area of the kidneys is to feed a diet that's enriched in EPA and DHA directly, which would be actually fish, fish meal, fish oils, fish products. Um, and so uh, that's something to keep in mind when we're talking about diets. Okay, so now, uh, I want to show you this table. I've talked about the nutrients and there are some recommended levels for these specific nutrients that are key to managing the renal patient. You can see that they're listed here. These, these levels of, of nutrients are listed on a percent dry matter basis and you should be able to um, find those, those levels for diets if you want to make a comparison to this table in the product reference guides. And so we have uh, uh, certain levels for the dog, we have specific levels for the cat, and, um, and the nutrients that I identified earlier. If you're not quite familiar um, with antioxidants, certainly vitamin E and vitamin C are very important antioxidants that we wanna look at and ensure that enough of that is in the diet as well. So I mentioned earlier that phosphorus is the absolute key nutrient that is number one most important, okay? And, and unfortunately, that sort of limits some to some degree the diets that we really wanna choose to feed our renal patients, particularly if they're in stage two, three, and four of iris staging CKD. And the reason is, is because um, there are a lot of the over-the-counter commercial grocery store type of 
of cat foods at least and dog foods as well are very high in phosphorus. I have this little chart up here to just to give you an idea that of average phosphorus levels of grocery store brands can be up to five times higher in phosphorus content than our prescription renal diets like um, Hills KD, um, uh, different values. So, so that's one of the problems with um, finding the right diet to match our phosphorus needs for these patients. Luckily though, luckily there are a number of companies that provide prescription renal diets. And these diets are, are really key because they are adjusted or restricted in phosphorus. The protein levels that we'll see in just a minute vary a little bit as well as the sodium and N3 fatty acid levels, but they're all, all these re prescription renal diets are restricted in, in phosphorus, just as a um, kind of a fun fact, um, Hills Company is the first is the first company that came up with a prescription diet, and their very first prescription diet was actually a canine KD diet. And so that's kind of like history. I don't know how old everyone is on here, but but uh, that that's pretty that's pretty amazing that they started the whole trend of prescription diets. Um, one of the newer companies that now have prescription diets is the Blue Company. They have a variety of um, prescription diets for different disease states. They have a very palatable uh, canine and feline um, renal prescription diet that is accepted well by uh, a lot of patients. Purina and Royal Canin also have excellent uh, prescription renal diets available. And then if we get away from the traditional canned and dry food, there's a company called Just Food for Dogs, and they are a fresh food company. And they have a couple of um, diets in their um, battery that are prescription-like, and they have, um, they have one or two for the dogs that have varying levels of protein and ultimately lower phosphorus. Okay, so these next two slides, I just want to show you, I, I want to give you these tables or show you these tables that are comparing the different uh, prescription renal diets that are available. So this is a table, first one for the cat. Um, the cat's uh, renal diets are pretty cool right now because over the last several years, the pet food companies have appreciated through lots of research um, and clinical trials that cats that are put on renal diets early, like stage two, and they stay on them to stage three, stage three and four CKD, we observe a lot of muscle wasting in those animals. And it makes sense because the protein levels are so restricted. But because um, these diets, our renal diets are formulated with animal protein sources, that bumps up the phosphorus level in the diet. And so what they've determined, at least Purina, Hills, and Royal Canin have now come up with what they call early stage renal diets for the cat. And they also, if you go down to the bottom uh, of, the, of the table in the green area, you can see that they also have advanced care renal diets for the cat. And if you look at, just look at the phosphorus level column uh, compared to the, to the um, the nutrient targets at the very bottom row, you can see that both their early stage as well as their advanced stage have phosphorus levels that are within the range that's recommended for the feline renal patient. The only ones that don't is the Royal Canin uh, Renal Support Early Consult. Um, and the other thing to, uh, to notice is that the early stage diets have a higher protein level than the advanced stage diets. And that's really important because what's it, what it's meant to do is help maintain lean muscle mass longer as the animals progress through the various stages of renal disease. You can also see that um, if we're dealing with hypertension that the sodium levels are restricted in these diets and the fatty acid levels N3 fatty acid levels uh, vary across companies as well. And at the last column of this table, what I've done is um, this table, the cat table as well as the dog table, I have indicated um, or suggested which stages of um, CKD iris staging uh, are what these diets would be appropriate for. Okay, so we also have, I also have a table, a summary table for the dog. 
Um, and this, this table contains all prescription diets, but they're not all renal diets. And the reason is uh, because until very recently, very recently, there has been no specific diet formulated for the dog that has been diagnosed with early stage renal disease, okay? Um, I call the renal, the majority of renal diets that are on the market, multi-purpose diets, meaning there's only one formula. It may be different flavors, but there's one formula and it's set at a phosphorus and protein level for those animals that are really in more advanced stages of renal disease. But just very recently, Royal Canin has um, marketed a renal support early consult diet in canned as well as in dry. As you saw earlier, they also have it for the cat. Again, their protein levels are increased, which is nice, and their phosphorus levels are a little higher than what is recommended. And so um, just a FYI, there are some diets that are non-renal formulated diets that you can use in early stage renal disease canine patients because their phosphorus level is low and their protein level is somewhat restricted. And that one I have at the top is Hills GD, G as in geriatric. Um, you could also look at the Hills JD diet, which is a joint diet. Um, and then they have, I have a, um, a liver diet, Hills LD, and then there are some over-the-counter um, a couple diets I have listed there that are just a titch over our phosphorus, but very, very close. Um, you can also see that whether, when we're talking about the canine multi-purpose diets that they vary in um, N3 fatty acid content as well. So um, because we identified the inflammation associated with renal disease and we've identified that N3 fatty acids can be very helpful in, in part of the nutritional management aspect of them. I think it's important to point out that, um, that go ahead and, and hit the next, the next button, thank you. Uh, it's important to point out that the omega-3 fatty acid levels that we see in the product reference guides for these different diets are giving you the level of the parent omega-3 fatty acid. They're not giving you the level of the biologically active inflammatory, anti-inflammatory aspect of omega-3s, which is EPA and DHA. And so if the diets have a high omega-3 fatty acid level, as you see in some of these here, it's important for you to look at the ingredient list and make sure that, uh, that there is uh, fish oil, salmon oil, Manhattan fish oil, some kind of fish, uh, straight up fish meat or fish meal in that diet to give you high enough levels of EPA and DHA to be, um, to be useful as anti, as anti-inflammatory components for the renal, um, renal patient. So, um, if on the other hand, you choose to use a diet that's that's got uh, a omega-3 fatty acid source like flaxseed, which is the parent, but not high in EPA and DHA directly, you can go ahead and um, use some supplements, fatty acid supplements. There are many, many of them on the market, both um, veterinary as well as human products that are commonly used. Plum's Veterinary Drug Handbook has a has a recommended dose for renal disease for omega-3 fatty acids. You can see it's a little bit different for the cat than it is for the dog, and that both of them are based on um, giving you the level of EPA and DHA per, per kilogram of body weight um, in, in a metabolic body weight profile. That's what the 0.67 and the 0.75 are giving you. So um, you can use that information to determine how much uh, omega-3 or EPA is in your diet, and then you can make up the difference. If you could go back for just a second, you can make up the difference with, um, with the right amount of supplement because all supplements are not the same. They all have a very different concentration of EPA and DHA. So just for the curious mind, I actually uh, kind of took the uh, looked at what the different renal diets were for the cat and the dog and averaged what their, um, what their levels uh, were. And I found that at the, on average, the cat prescription renal diets 
were were actually above what was indicated by by plum so that's good and the dog the average dog renal diets are a little bit below and so you might keep that in mind and think about additional fish oil supplementation all right so we've gotten to when to start how soon to start nutritional intervention what kind of nutrients that the compromised kidney um, can handle and tolerate and um, and what kind of diets are available to provide that nutrient picture. So now we want to know how much do we actually feed of these diets that we've chosen. So it's really important, uh, and I think I've listed this in the in nutritional goals, is to make sure you're giving sufficient energy to maintain your patient's body condition score, which is the same as fat cover, and their lean muscle mass. And a very generalized way to, to appreciate this is that the DER or daily energy requirement for a chronic kidney disease patient is going to be very similar to if they were a healthy pet, okay? Um, and and, um, and that's, uh, that sometimes can be a hard target to hit. Malnutrition is a very common complication of chronic kidney disease in both cats and dogs as well as people. Um, anytime there's inadequate inad energy intake for a prolonged period of time, we're going to get a breakdown of our, our fat and muscle to provide um, energy and protein needed for that patient to try and survive. And so when that happens, the longer it goes on, the increased morbidity and mortality we see in these patients. So how do you figure out how, many, uh, how, much, how much energy, how many calories your patient needs a day? Well, I have um, two very easy um, uh, equations that you can look at here and you can calculate that with the daily energy requirement or the daily calorie requirement for these patients. Uh, you can calculate it by using their ideal body weight times 30 plus 70. And then for the dog, you would multiply that by 1.6. And for the cat, you would multiply that by 1.2. If you don't want to go through that, that's a pretty accurate calculation. If you don't want to go through that, there's a more general guideline of 30 to 50 kcals um, per kilogram body weight per day. Okay, and because of the range, I would use 30 if the animal's underweight and under condition. I would use 50 um, if they're in good body condition and good muscling, and 40 if they're somewhere in between. Okay, so. We've been assuming that our patients are going to eat on their own, and it would just be awesome if they all did. But unfortunately, they oftentimes get to a point where they stop eating consistently. And when they stop eating consistently, then we worry about malnutrition. And so that's the time I'm hoping that you guys will start thinking about assisted feeding. And uh, the earlier you institute it, um, the better it is for the patient. Um, if they're not eating their um, resting energy requirement or their basic energy requirement consistently, that's indication for putting in a feeding tube or doing syringe feeding. Uh, if the owner cannot medicate that animal without stressing both the pet and the owner out, it's a good reason to put in a feeding tube. Um, if the medications that the animal is taking are going to adversely affect their appetite, um, that's going to decrease the amount of um, calorie intake they have every day, so feeding tube. So um, bottom line is there are a couple different ways you can put in a feeding tube or use syringe feeding on these patients, but the feeding tubes actually facilitate not only getting the right amount of nutrient calories into the animal, but can also be used for maintaining their hydration status instead of sticking them with sub-Q fluids on a regular basis. And it would be an easy, stressful way, stress-free way to deliver their medications. Um, and so ultimately, hopefully it will improve the quality of life of everyone. If you're choosing to and need to place a, a feeding tube, whether it's a nasoenteric tube, an esophagostomy tube, or a gastrostomy tube, then um, we may need to change the form of the diet. And so here's a table with some liquid diets that are formulated to have restricted phosphorus, adjusted protein, uh, lower sodium, and um, appropriate uh, levels of uh, potassium in them. You can see on the canine 
column that there's only one veterinary diet available for this right now, and it's the Royal Canin Renal Support Canine. Um, under that, we have one, two, three, four other um, diet options, liquid diets. Two of them, Paritiv and Suplina, are human prescription diets. And then Insure Plus Vanilla or Boost Plus Vanilla are human over-the-counter diets that would also um, fit the bill in terms of meeting, um, meeting their phosphorus tolerance needs as well as protein, sodium, et cetera. You can see that the caloric density of those diets varies anywhere from 1.3 all the way up to 1.8. On the other column for feline, our options are a little more limited. Um, Royal Canin does have a renal support feline liquid diet available. Uh, and then aside from that, it's, it's a little more challenging to use the human liquid diets because there isn't adequate taurine or arginine in those diets for the cat. So if you're going to use them, you need to supplement the cat with taurine and arginine every day. Um, and please note that these human over-the-counter diets or OTC diets, you should only use the vanilla flavor. I know it's gonna be tempting. You might wanna use butterscotch, you might wanna use Dutch chocolate, but please just stick to the vanilla. Okay, so if you do choose to put in a tube for more long-term feeding, like an esophagostomy tube, for instance, they're very easy to put in. Um, you would want to uh, you would want to put together what we call a diet blend to put down this tube for feeding, and that's where we take appropriate canned diets for renal disease and a liquid, put them in the blender, mix them together, and then come up with a certain caloric density or kcals per mil, so we know how much to feed that animal every day. And I've just given a couple of examples of recipes, quote unquote, um, that for the cat that are low protein, low phosphorus in nature. So using Purina Feline Advanced Care or Feline, Hills Feline KD, or even the blue um, K plus M Feline Diet and mixing two cans of those with um, one container uh, of the Royal Canin Renal Support Feline uh, gives you um, a, a very nice usable diet blend for the cat. Alternatively, for the dog, we also have a uh, low protein, low phosphorus diet blend for esoph esophagostomy or gastrostomy tube feeding. Again, um, Purina NF, uh, KD, or even the Blue KS diet can be used one can, because it's a much larger can, with one bottle of Royal Canin Renal Support Canine. And again, that, that blend will, um, will meet the needs of these renal patients. We are going to have, once in a while, we're going to get those renal patients that are non-azotemic, but they are proteinuric. And so what do we do with that? How do we feed those patients? Well, it's really important to appreciate that proteinuria does contribute to nephron loss and that excess protein will potentiate proteinuria. So what we need to do is figure out how to balance the protein in the diet so that we're not perpetuating the proteinuria, but at the same time meeting the animal's protein needs. And we can do this by gradually, by starting feeding with a very restricted protein renal diet, prescription diet, and then over time slowly adding in uh, a protein source that's high biological value and hopefully very low or does not or, or deficient or minimal in phosphorus, okay? And to tell you the truth, egg white is really the best choice for that. It's a very high protein, great high biological value, and the phosphorus is super, super, super low in the egg white itself. Um, and you would, you would keep adding that until, um, until you, you hit your maximum in terms of not having the UPC get any higher, um, but at the same time, not um, a, a, um, evaluating the patient and not seeing um, uh, prolonged muscle wasting. So how much egg white do you use? Well, uh, if I could get one more click on this because it includes both our liquid egg whites, such as egg beaters egg whites, or the white from a whole egg. And, um, and so looking at these guidelines, if you take either the white from a whole egg or two tablespoons of egg beaters or a liquid egg white product, um, 
And um, you add that to the diet, um, an advanced stage renal diet, then you can increase the overall protein level in the patient's diet up to where the protein level would be in early stage or senior life stage. If you were to add two cooked egg whites or four tablespoons of a liquid, you can bump up that protein from um, the lower level in an advanced stage renal diet up to adult maintenance life stage. And so uh, hopefully that, that those guidelines will be helpful for you. All right, um, of course, um, protein is not the only nutrient that we um, care about uh, with the non-acetemic proteinuric patient. Uh, we certainly want to mitigate that inflammation that's perpetuating our protein loss, adjust our phosphorus, our sodium to help control fluid retention, and again, antioxidants because it is a, it is a situation of high oxidative stress. All right, so that covers it. I've walked you through. I've walked you through when to start, um, what the kidney is, can tolerate in terms of nutrients and levels, what diets are available. Okay. And so I just want to finish this up with a, a couple slides here at the end. And I want to just mention a situation that we see pretty frequently, but can be very frustrating in regards to figuring out how to feed it. Um, and this is cases like Cubby. Cubby's a 10 year old male castrated mixed breed. You can see he is adorable, but his situation is that he had uh, more of an advanced stage CKD and pancreatitis, okay? And he was proteinuric and hypertensive, all right? So what do you do with that? If you would recall back of the tables I showed you, all of the, um, most of, almost all of the kit prescription renal diets are high in fat. And they do that to help um, increase the caloric density so they don't have to eat as much to meet their daily calorie needs, but also to enhance the palatability of the diet for those patients. So for a, a patient like Cubby, our nutritional concerns would be restricted phosphorus, of course, uh, lower high quality protein because he's also proteinuric. We want to control the sodium for the hypertension and we want to lower the fat for the pancreatitis, okay? Of course, also we want to look at um, omega-3s and, and we want a diet that's highly palatable. Um, so what do we look at? What do we have available? If you go back to the table that I showed you for the options for renal um, disease in dogs, I'm going to highlight this diet at the very top called Hills GD. Hills GD diet, I think the GD stands for geriatric diet. So it's a prescription geriatric diet, is restricted in phosphorus, is restricted in protein, and is restricted in fat. Okay. It is the lowest fat diet on that table and is also restricted in sodium. And so this diet is my go to diet for the canine patient that is CKD with pancreatitis. Whether or not they have proteinuria or not, or hypertension, I still use this be with if they have pancreatitis and CKD because the fat level is low enough, okay? Next, I think one of the last couple slides, I do wanna let you know that GD is not the only option. Uh, I like it the best, but also Royal Cain and hepatic canned food can also um, be beneficial and generally do no harm to these patients that are uh, canine patients that have CKD and need a fat restricted diet. Also just food for dogs or JFFD has something called hepatic and they also have something called balanced remedy that could work for these patients. And if push comes to shove um, and the animal won't eat any of these other ones or they're not available, I sometimes use the Hills ID low fat stew. It's not optimal, but it's the next tier down. Other things you can think about if your patients are having, or you're having trouble getting your patients to eat these prescription diets, your special diets is appetite stimulants, toppers. Lots of people like to go with toppers. There are ones that are gonna be low phosphorus, uh, low sodium and adjusted, not really high in protein. And I've listed some here for you. Um, there's also the homemade diet option. And don't forget that if the animal's hyperexia um, lasts longer than is somewhere between seven and 10 days or longer, or they've been anorexic for up to five days that you really should think about doing assisted feeding. My last slide here is just to give you uh, a table to look at, which has 
for the dog prescription diets that are not renal, but could be used in the renal patient uh, when it's an earlier stage renal disease. So I have uh, um, DD, uh, Hill CD, uh, LD is a liver diet, WD is a weight maintenance diet, ZD is a dermatological diet. Again, the Royal Canaan Hepatic, just food for dogs. And then I have a couple of non-prescription over-the-counter diets that have a phosphorus level in them that is very, very close to our cutoff. So it could be used as a second tier. Um, Hill Science Diet or HSD, adult seven plus chicken and barley entree. Um, and and um, another um, small and toy breed chicken and barley entree. And then Ruruva. The Ruruva company has several diets for the dog with really funky names, Foul Ball, Love Me Tender, Funk M, The Trunk, uh, that are, are um, sodium restricted as well. On the other side of the slide, I have a similar um, list of Ruruva diets for the cat. They are non-prescription diets. And you can see there, I have their phosphorus levels listed as well as their sodium levels. So you can compare them to the, to the, um, to the reference, uh, recommended reference uh, level at the top of that, those, um, at the top of those columns. So that's it. That's all I have for you. It's been really great to share with you the information that I have, and I hope that you find it helpful. I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. We've had so many attendees. So always love to see this, especially because we see geriatric renal disease all the time or renal disease in our geriatric patients. Now, one question I wanted to start out with is what are your criteria for a decision to add cooked egg, egg white into the diet? Oh, that's a great question. And uh, the criteria that I like to use is one, if the animal is proteinuric, and their muscle wasting, they're, they're showing muscle wasting, like you can obviously see that they've lost muscle mass, and their UPC is um, greater for the dog, greater than 0.5, and greater than one for the cat. I will start out with feeding them a very low protein, one of the lowest protein renal diets, and then after about two weeks, I'll start adding in some egg to see if they can tolerate that higher protein with no phosphorus. And then I'll keep checking the UPC maybe every three, three weeks to see when I've hit that, that golden spot where they are, your UPC isn't getting any higher. And maybe even if we're lucky dropping a little bit um, and, and they're able to maintain their muscle mass better. Great. And then I just wanted to give everyone the reminder, remember if you're a non vecral elite member, you can get a free half hour of race approved CE thanks to sponsorship from Blue Buffalo. So make sure to fill out that form right now. That form is going to close in 30 minutes. So again, it's really only limited to elite uh, to elite members or those who are watching it live. So again, please scan a picture um, and go ahead and fill out that survey right away. And again, we just want to give a huge shout out to Blue Buffalo for being able to make this opportunity for CE free. Uh, Dr. Sacker absolutely loved it. Now let's do two more questions for the sake of time. What is your favorite omega-3 supplement for dogs and cats? And does formulation matter? Does it have to be a chew versus a capsule versus a liquid? That's a really interesting question. I, um, it doesn't have to be any specific form. It's really kind of dependent on the animal. You know, liquid is going to be uh, easy to squirt on their food, but it may, some animals don't like that really fishy, um, fishy smell. And so they might not eat it. Uh, soft gels, um, if you have, don't have any trouble pilling your animal, then soft gel is, is nice, clean um, way to give it. Um, there is a product that's really nifty. It's called, it's made by Bear, and um, it's an N3 um, fatty acid fish oil, and it's called a snip tip. So it's in a soft gel, and it has this little kind of at, at one apex of the soft gel, it has this little tip that you just, um, you just twist, and it opens up the soft gel so that you can squeeze it on their food. And so that's really nice because when um, anytime 
air or light hits fish oil, it's going to start to break it down. And um, if you use a liquid diet and you don't seal the bottle well, then over time that product is going to oxidize. It's, we're going to have a peroxidation and it's going to turn rancid. And so the soft gels are a little bit safer in regards to long-term long -term feeding. Thank you. And I think a lot of people forget that, you know, hydrogen peroxide is in a brown bottle. So many of the medications come in a brown vial. There is a reason why, because it's light sensitive. So please keep that in mind. There's no point in a, um, giving it if uh, it's degraded. So really important. All right. Last question. What are some good diets for cats with stage three chronic kidney disease and pancreatitis or IBD or food allergy? Good question. Um, the diets that I would go to for that, um, that where there's a food allergy involved is I would need to look at my hypo, I would want to look at my hypoallergenic diets. And um, the hypoallergenic diet that's really going to fit the bill the best, it's not perfect, would be Hill ZD, actually. Um, and that's because the phosphorus level is low enough. Um, both Purina and um, Royal Canin make hydrolyzed diets, but their phosphorus level is too high for the renal patients. So Hill ZD is really the best one or a homemade diet. Wonderful. Thank you. And I just wanted to thank you again, Dr. Sackard. That was an amazing YouTube live event. Um, if you guys have any feedback, please make sure to type it in right now. We'll make sure to pass that on to both the speaker and also to Blue Buffalo, the sponsor. And uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time to learn over whatever time hour you are, lunchtime, coffee time. Uh, so really appreciate it. Um, I also did want to uh, make sure you guys filled out that form to get your CE. We promise we will email that out within the next week. So uh, be aware of that. And always stay tuned. We are always offering free YouTube live events. Uh, we are actually hosting a free Spanish webinar tomorrow on canine hypoadrenal corticism. So check that out on the website. Our first four Spanish webinars are free in 2022. And lastly, thank you for all that you guys do. Um, COVID curbside pandemic craziness was supposed to end a year ago, and we're going into our second year, and it's still crazy. And I know we've had staff shortages, and everyone's overworked, and everyone's just fried and burnt out and crispy. And thank you for all that you guys do and taking the time to learn at the same time. Uh, we will see you at the next event. And again, thank you all for participating and uh, have a good